is Tuesday night Bible study. It feels like it's been a long time since we've been here for a Bible study. Well, I think you guys, I was I was elsewhere, but anyways. Um, so tomorrow, just kind of put a quick note out there, is the beginning of the month of Adar. Um, it's amazing how fast the months go when you start paying attention to Yahweh's calendar. Um, like it seems like as we're going through this journey of, you know, Kislev and then all every month after that, it seems like they're going faster and faster. Um, and it's the times that we're living in. As I, I said on Sabbath, it's accelerated times. And we are living in the last days. Um, this is, um, we're going to get into this a little bit more on Sabbath, but um, the, the things that have come out prophetically about this year, um, it's just time for us all to, to get it right, to walk with Yahweh, and to just never look back because he, that's what he's called us to do. Um, and so in line with this, um, I want to talk about how, how do we live successfully in these days? How do, we, how do we live a life that is a life of victory and not defeat? Um, so to start out, let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. <clears throat> and we know um, if you listen to anything that Rick Renner is talking about with... Um, Paul writing to Timothy. Timothy was living in a very tough place in the world. Um, the Emperor Nero had begun persecuting Christians, and uh, where Timothy was preaching in Ephesus was one of the centers of the worship of Diana of the Ephesians, and therefore it was one of the high, highest places of persecution against Christians. So here's Timothy finding himself in the midst of very dangerous situations, very perilous times, if you want to say. Um, and we, we see when he tells him, God has not given you a spirit of fear. That means Timothy was tempted to be afraid. He also speaks of calling to mind Timothy's tears. So Timothy was crying at some points. Um, but he's calling to mind his faith um, in so many of these cases. But not only is he calling to mind Timothy's faith, he's giving Timothy examples of how he walks. Timothy is his son in the faith. And so as a father, he's teaching him, this is how I walked through things. Now this is how you can pattern yourself after me. And so in 2 Timothy chapter 3, um, Paul writes, But understand this, that in the last days will come perilous times of great stress and trouble, hard to deal with and hard to bear. I think we've started experiencing a small taste of that in the, the last couple years. It's, it, I mean, for a long time. You think when, when Paul's writing this, it's centuries ago, um, but things have certainly picked up over the past couple years like they never have before. Um, verse 2 says, For people will be lovers of self and utterly self-centered, lovers of money and aroused by an inordinate desire for wealth, proud and arrogant and contemptuous boasters. They will be abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, holy, unholy, and profane. They will be without natural human affection, callous and inhuman, relentless, admitting of no truce or appeasing, appeasement. They will be slanderers, false accusers, troublemakers, intemperate and loose in morals and conduct, uncontrolled and fierce, haters of good. We're seeing that so much in this day and age when evil is being called good and good is being called evil. Uh, they will be treacherous, betrayers, rash and inflated with self-conceit. They will be lovers of sensual pleasures and vain amusements more than and rather than lovers of God. For although they hold a form of piety, they deny and reject and are strangers to the power of it. Their conduct belies the genuineness of their profession. Avoid all such people, turn away from them. So when he's saying this, he's saying that in the, in the last days perilous times shall come. We can't, it's not something that we can believe away. It's not something that we can have faith to say perilous times won't come. It's, it's, Bi it's Bible. Um, let's turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 real quick. <clears throat> Paul's a good example of someone who, is, who came through a lot of perils, but we'll see how he handled them. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11, uh, we'll start at verse, uh, verse 24. 
Five times I received from the hands of the Jews 40 lashes all but one. Three times I have been beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I have been on board a ship wrecked at sea. A whole night and a day I have spent adrift on the deep. Many times on journeys exposed to perils from rivers, perils from bandits, perils from my own nation, perils from Gentiles, perils in the city, perils in desert places, perils in the sea. Get the picture, he's under a lot of peril. Perils uh, from those posing as believers, but destitute of Christian knowledge and piety. In toil and hardship, watching often, in hunger and thirst, frequently driven to fasting, in cold and exposure and lack of clothing. And besides those things that are without, there's the daily inescapable pressure of my care for the, all the churches. Now, interesting, when you start looking at the things that, that Paul went through, well, he, he's able to list he was beaten with rods, he was stoned. Well, most people, they were stoned once, and that was it. Most people didn't get up after a stoning. We know his, the story of his stoning and how he, everybody gathered, the church gathered around him and prayed, and he was raised up. Three times he was shipwrecked. Now, we read about one shipwreck, but he was apparently shipwrecked three different times. Most people would say, I'm never getting aboard a ship after that. And, you know, you think of it, how many people have died in shipwrecks? How many people have died, been lost out at sea, whatever? He went through three of those, and it, he couldn't be killed. Um, Perils from, from bandits, from this and from that in the desert, in the city. Remember when he was let down over the wall in a basket because they were chasing after him? All these different things happened to Paul, but he couldn't, he couldn't be knocked out. He, he could not be taken out of his race. And, and you see, when, when he was, that time when he was shipwrecked and um, ended up on the island, and it's like an island of cannibals, and so then, then, then all of a sudden he's bitten by the snake, and, and it's like all these things start happening. It's like, okay, am I? What? Am, why is all this stuff starting to happen? But Yahweh delivered him out of every single situation. He delivered him out of them all. Uh, let's turn back over to Second Timothy real quick. Second um, Timothy chapter four. Second Timothy 4, 7 says, I have fought the good, worthy, honorable, and noble fight. I have finished the race. I have kept and firmly held the faith. Skip down to verse 17. He's talking again about the stuff that happened. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me the gospel message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was delivered out of the jaws of the lion. That's a pretty bad place. If you're in the jaws of the lion, it's not, not really a place you'd want to camp out. And indeed, the Lord will certainly deliver and draw me to himself from every assault of evil. He will preserve and bring me safe unto his heavenly kingdom. So Paul's talking about finishing his race. First of all, I fought the good fight. He's saying and throughout his life, he's fought the good fight. He's finished the race and he has kept the faith. So those three things kind of set a course of questions for us. Um, how do we make it all the way? How do we finish our race? You know, I, I'm, I don't know about you, but for me, I want to finish my race. I don't want to just start strong. I want to finish strong. I want to be able to say like Paul did at the end when the rapture ha comes, because I believe it's happening in our lifetime. But I want to be able to say that I kept the faith, that I, I fought the good fight that I've run the race the way God has called me to. But in order to do so, we need to know how. You know, it's not enough to, to, to just read these things and say, yeah, Paul did a good job at running his race. Well, how does that apply to our life? How do we make it all, all the way? 1 Corinthians 9.26 says, I do not run uncertainly without definite aim. I do not run without a definite goal, another translation says. I do not flail around like one beating the air just shadow boxing. You think of it, a boxer in the ring, if he just started going around and just like beating the air, he's, he's not setting himself up to win that, that round very well. You know, I mean, for one, he might draw some very strange looks, but he's setting, setting himself up for the enemy, the opponent, to be able to get a knockout punch in there if he's not making every punch count. Um, 
Another translation says, I do not run aimlessly, but I run straight for the finish line. I don't shadow box, but try to make every punch count. Uh, another one says, I run the race then with determination. That's how we have to run the race of life, with determination. I am no shadow boxer, I really fight. We really are fighting in this life. <laughs> if you're not fighting, then you're going with the flow and then you're, you're putting yourself in a position where the enemy can take you out. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.5 says that if an athlete is running a race, he must obey all the rules in order to win. So in order to finish our race, in, in order to uh, win our race, because it's not just the finishing, it's winning that crown, because he talks about that, pursuing that crown that's at the end of it, you have to obey all the rules in order to, to win. How many of you remember Dad's message, Rules of Holy Living, that he talk, talked about? There are rules in life, and that's not a popular, it's not a popular word. Um, people don't like rules. But you know what? There's rules for everything. Yes. There's laws. There are laws that control the universe. There are laws that control everything around us. Yes. And breaking those laws, either in ignorance or purposely, will set you up for um, not having a successful life. It will set you up for failure in life. Um, in order to make it all the way and run our course and cross that finish line, we have to follow the rules of successful living and we have to be protected all the way. Now we talked on Sabbath about how Brother Copeland had that prophecy about the correction, direction, uh, protection and perfection. If we want to reach the end, the perfection, we have to be protected. Like you're not going to finish your race if you're not protected all the way. You're not going to finish your race if you're taken out early by something. Um, Someone who has made it, you look at somebody, even, even in the natural, who's made it to 90, 100, 110, 120 years old, they've made it through a lot of stuff in their lifetime. They've made it through a lot of stuff that has taken out a lot of other people in their life. Most of them, you think of, if, you, if, you, if you're around older people, whether it be in a nursing home or whatever, most of them, their friends are all gone. Most of them, their family even. Sometimes even their children have died before them. So you're making it beyond what other people make it. Um, and we're going to kind of go down a side journey in this, this uh, talking about perfect, pr protection. But young people dying at 15, 18, 20, even 30, 40, 50, 60 is not the will of God. It's never the will of God for somebody to die young, ever. People dying in disasters, whether it be a natural disaster, a plane crash, a car crash, it's never the will of God. Young people dying from drug overdoses is not the will of God. And I think most people can see that. Well, it's a drug, dr drug overdose, obviously, that's not the will of God. But it's just as much not the will of God for somebody to dr die in a car crash as it is for somebody to die of a drug overdose. And we need to find out why. All the people that Yeshua raised from the dead, think about it, throughout, throughout the New Testament, throughout the Gospels, all the people that he raised from de the dead were young people. They had not lived out their life. They had not finished their, their, their race. You think of the young girl that he raised from the dead, the boy who was, the, the mother was on the way to the funeral and he raised him from the dead. Even Paul with that boy who fell out of the window because he had preached so long and the boy fell asleep and fell out of the window, he was a young boy. He was raised from the dead. They had not lived out their days and that's very specifically said. So in order to know about living a long life and living a successful life, we need to know what the Bible says the, the length of life should be. Genesis 6.3 says, My spirit shall not forever dwell and strive with man, for he also is flesh, but his days shall be 120 years. Now, I had this very interesting encounter uh, with a Jewish man that's, uh, that's in, that lives in Israel. And we had gotten into a discussion, and in the midst of the discussion, now he's not a particularly religious Jew, although living in Israel, he does have more of a, an awareness of God than most other Jews living in the rest of the world. But he made this comment to me in the midst of it, and he said, you have 120 years on the earth to live. And I, it's just amazing to me because it's like, here's this Jewish man who has more of an understanding about the truth of the word of God than most Christians do. 
And that's a sad commentary. We talk about how we live in the new covenant, how our covenant's the better covenant. Well, the way most Christians are living, they're not living as if their covenant's the better covenant. If, if, if under the old covenant, they say that you have 120 years, and now suddenly under the new covenant, well, you know, you never know what the will of God might be. That doesn't seem like a better covenant to me. Um, Deuteronomy 34, 7 says that Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural strength abated. Think of it. When Moses died, he climbed a mountain and died. You don't see this picture of this frail little old man on a bed, you know, his strength sapping away. No, he says, go, I'm going to go climb this mountain, and then, and then he died. You know, that's the way to go. I don't, care if you're, I don't care if you're 120 years old. If the Bible says it, if the Bible has that image, you can grab hold of that. Your days shall be 120 years. That's the biblical span of life. Uh, let's turn over to Psalm 90 because a lot, of, a lot of Christians grab a hold of this as the span of life and they try to, try to use scripture to back it up. <clears throat> Psalm chapter 90, and I'm reading out of the Amplified because I'm going to read the footnote on it. Um, Psalm chapter 90 verse Nine, for all our days out here in this wilderness, says Moses, pass away in your wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told, for we adults know we are doomed to die soon without reaching Canaan. The days of our years are threescore years and ten, which is seventy years, or even if by reason of strength, fourscore years, eighty years. Yet their pride and additional years only labor and sorrow, for it is soon gone and we fly away. So a lot of people say, look at this and look at the pattern that's set in Exodus and say, we're allotted seventy to eighty years in life. The footnote on this thing in the Amplified is very interesting. It picks up on some good uh, biblical uh, verses. This psalm is credited to Moses, who is interceding with God to remove the curse which made it necessary for every Israelite over 20 years of age when they rebelled against God at Kadesh Barnea to die before reaching the promised land. That's Numbers chapter 14, 26 through 35. Moses says that most of them are dying at 70 years of age. This number has often been mistaken as a set span of life for all mankind. It was not intended to refer to anyone except those Israelites under the curse during that particular 40 years. 70 years has never been the average span of life for humanity. When Jacob, the father of the 12 tribes, had reached 130 years in Genesis 47.9, he complained that he had not attained to the years of his immediate ancestors. In fact, Moses himself lived to be 120 years, Aaron 123, Miriam several years older, and Joshua 110 years of age. Note as well that in the millennium, a person dying at 100 will still be thought of as a child. There you go. There you have it. The biblical span of life, unless you're associating yourself with the rebellious generations of the Israelites that were limited, uh, your biblical span of life is 120 years. Um, so let's turn over to Isaiah 65. We'll see the verse that it referenced there. <clears throat> Isaiah 65, we'll start at verse 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a rejoicing and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. And the sound of weeping will no more be heard in it, nor the cry of distress. There shall no more be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who dies prematurely. Now, interesting, it specifically says the old man who dies prematurely. So don't let the enemy take you out before your time. I don't care what your age is. You know, if, 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 you're, if you're finding that the enemy is attacking you with some sort of uh, illness in your body or coming against you with something that's trying to take you out, 
you have the right, the biblical right, to resist that, no matter your age. Uh, for the child shall die a hundred years old, and the sinner who dies when only a hundred years old shall be thought only a child cut off because he is accursed. So in the millennium, people are going to be living long past a hundred, and if you die at a hundred in the millennium, you're still going to be thought of as a child. That's how God set things. When he, when he created the earth, we, you know, Dad talks about this, how, how when, when you look at the Bible, there's three places that you can find the will of God. You can find it in the, in the Garden of Eden before the fall. You find it in the life of Yeshua, and you find it in the millennium. You find it in heaven. But if, if there's those, th those places are not having people that are dying of, in car crashes or of diseases, then it's not God's will for anybody to die of that. And, you know, it's, it's a strategy of the enemy to cause people to believe this because what it, ha what it makes people do is it deceives them into passivity. They become passive. If you think everything might be the will of God somehow, then you're not going to fight against something and recognize that it's the enemy coming to steal, kill, and destroy. You know, you hear, how, many, how many have been to a funeral and you hear, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Yeah, well, they're quoting Job, and what do we know about Job? When he said, the thing I feared came upon me. He opened the door for the stuff that was going on. It had nothing to do with the Lord giving, the Lord taking away. God is not the stealer. He's not the destroyer. He's not the one who takes the lives of babies. He's not the one who takes the lives of young people. He's not the one who takes people out in disease. Most of the time, if we're honest about the situations, we can realize that it's not, not, not God at all. Like I said, you know, it's a, a young person who dies of an, a drug overdose. I, I have been to funerals where the pastor who's leading it says, well, somehow this was the will of God. You know, we don't understand. We don't always understand the will of God. His ways are far more mysterious than us. It's like, no, it had to do with their choices. And I get it. You know, they're trying to be sensitive to the family and all that. But there's sometimes when you got to say personal accountability. You make certain choices, kind of like what we were talking about on Sabbath. You can't, you can't control the consequences that come with those choices that you make. The consequences are already on the road. Um, a good soldier is always a loss to an army when he dies an early death. Think of it. People aren't rejoicing over soldiers that are taken out in battle. There might be a veteran who lives to be 100 years, and then they can celebrate his life, and, oh, he lived such a full life, and he fought in this war and stuff like that. But if he's taken out early, it's not a rejoicing thing. It's not something that they, they rejoice about. It's a very tragic thing. Another misunderstanding in the church is that it's appointed, up, it's appointed unto man a time to die. I know if you're around church circles, you hear that one. It's under, appointed unto man a time to die. That's misquoting a scripture. Hebrews 9.27 says it's appointed unto man once to die. Once to die, not a time to die. Not like your time to die is Tuesday at 3.30 p.m. That's not what it's talking about. Uh, P another translation of that verse says, people are destined to die once and then face judgment. So people think that when your day is here, your hour is up, that's it. God decides when to take you, but that's not true. We have much more say, much more power is in our hands than we even realize over our own life. We can lengthen or shorten our days depending on how we walk, depending on how we live our lives, and depending on what we believe. So much of it is what you believe. And a, a lot of times you don't find out what you believe unless you're in a situation where there's pressure put on you. You can think, yeah, I believe the word that says, by his stripes I'm healed. Yeah, I believe that God meets all my needs according to his riches and glory. But when you start facing a crisis, when you start facing pressure that's put on that word, what is going to be the first thing that comes out of your mouth will, will show you where you're really at. Um, let's turn over to Ecclesiastes 7, chapter 7. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes chapter 7, and we'll look down at verse 17. 
Be not wicked overmuch or willfully, neither be foolish. Why should you die before your time? You see that in that scripture? Why should you die before your time? If, it, if everybody's appointed a time to die, then according to people's theological beliefs on it, you can't die unless God has said it's your time. I mean, that's, that's common theology. You can't die unless God has said that's your time. This verse is contradicting that. It's saying, why should you die before your time, before your life is finished? Another translation says, don't be too wicked and don't be a fool. Why should you die before your time is up? Another one says, don't be a foolish person. You will die young if you do so. So there's one clue as to what can open the door to dying before your time or dying prematurely, dying young, people dying young. Why should you die before your time? So foolishness and wickedness can cause many people to die before their time. There's been many people, I think I mentioned it briefly on Sabbath, that have done foolish things, just foolish things, even just like, just out of a whim of stupidity or peer pressure or whatever, just done something foolish and they're gone. You know, I'm sorry, there are laws in this universe, like I said, there are laws of nature. If you go and you stick, you stick something in an electrical socket, you're going to get shocked, other than a plug. Um, if you go and stick a fork in there, it's not going to say, well, this guy has never done something stupid before, so I, I'm not going, the, the law of electricity is not going to work right now because I'm going to respect that this guy normally is very smart and he doesn't do stuff like that. It, it's not, it's no respecter of persons. Electricity is no respecter of persons. You, it doesn't matter if that person is an electrician and went to school for it and has never touched a high-powered wire accidentally touches the high-powered wire, it's going to have the same effect on him as anybody else, okay? So some people do things that are foolish, careless, or purposely wicked, and they can die before their time. Think of Koran, Dathan, and Abiram in the Old Testament. You think of, they, they, they stood against God. I mean, they purposely were standing against God, rebelling against him, and what happened? They died an early death. Was that God's will for them? No. He, he did not want them to make that choice. He didn't want them to die early. Uh, Ananias and Sapphira. Yeah, that's quite the, the example. They lie to Holy Spirit and they die right there in church. That wasn't God's will. He didn't say, I want this to happen in my church service to teach everybody a lesson today. No, but you don't mess with the things of God. It was not God's will, but when people rebel against God, they can walk into judgment and may die before their time. Actually, let me rephrase that. They will walk into judgment eventually um, and may die before their time. Proverbs 29.1 is a familiar verse to us. It says that he who often being reproved hardens his neck will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. There's not too many things that the Bible says is without remedy or impossible. You know, nothing is impossible with God. But if you continuously set yourself in a course that's not right, you can set yourself up to be destroyed without any hope of recovery. And we never want to be in that place. When there is no protection, the enemy can kill, steal, and destroy. That's simply the fact of life. If you're not protected, the enemy can still kill and destroy. Um, think of, uh, I think it's in Luke where, where Yeshua is talking to his disciples and they're using this example of a tower that had fallen on some people in a city and he, he, you know, they're all saying that city must have been really, really wicked for all that stuff to happen. And he said to them, unless you all repent, you can all perish likewise. Like, don't think that you're going to escape judgment uh, if you're not going to repent of what you're doing that's opening a door to the enemy. You do something that opens the door to the enemy in your own personal life, the consequences can come pretty rapidly. Um, Job 22, 16 says, Will you pay attention and keep to the old way that the wicked men trod in Noah's time? Men who were snatched away before their time. See, again, there's that before their time. These, these men in the flood, that was not God's will for them. He didn't want to destroy them. He gave them, he gave them 120 years of Noah preaching to them, trying to get them to come on the ark. They said to God, depart from us, and what can the Almighty do for or to us? You hear the arrogance in their words? So arrogance, it's like actually taunting God, basically. Um, they're so set against God that they are snatched away before their time. 
Ecclesiastes 8.13 says, It will not be well with the wicked, neither will he prolong his days like a shadow, because he does not reverently fear and worship the Lord. The CEV translation says, But no one who sins and rejects God will prosper or live very long. The Good News translation says, It will not go well with the, the wicked. Their life is like a shadow, and they will die young because they do not obey God. Those are serious words. There's some serious scriptures in the Bible. Um, but they're there, as I said on Sabbath, they're there for warnings for us so that we don't go down that path to keep us safe. Deuteronomy 440 says, You shall keep his statutes and his commandments, that it may go well with you and your children, and that you may prolong your days in the land. <coughs> God does not want people to be dying young in the land. You see throughout, the, and, the, and I have a few examples here, but just look through the book of Deuteronomy. Time after time, he says, you know, obey the voice of the Lord that you may prolong your days in the land. He wants you to extend your life and live a long, full life. Deuteronomy 5.16 says, honor your father and your mother so that you may live long and that it may go well with you. Deuteronomy 30 verse 18 says, If your mind and heart turn away and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish and you shall not live long in the land. So you're worshiping other gods. A lot of people might think, oh, well, I'm not bowing down to the little statue of Baal here. But there are modern idols in life, modern gods that even, even yourself can be a god. You can serve yourself above God. And it says that if you do, do that, you're drawn away to worship other gods, not put Yahweh first, then you're going to perish. Exodus 20 verse 12 says, honor your father and mother again, so that your days may be long in the land. Ephesians 6, when it's talking about that in verse 2 through 3, says this is the first commandment with a promise that all may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. So Yahweh puts his commandments in place not to restrict our lives, but to protect us, to, to keep us alive long in the land. He knows what's wisdom. He knows what's not. Um, Proverbs 9.11 says, For by me, wisdom from God, your days shall be multiplied, and the years of your life shall be increased. By wisdom, your days shall be multiplied, and the years of your life shall be increased. Deuteronomy 30 verse 20 says, that you may love the Lord your God, obey his voice, and cling to him. For he is your life and the length of your days. Yahweh is your life and the length of your days. You, you have to cling to him. What does it mean to cling to somebody? You're, you're not going to let go no matter what. If something's clinging, I'm, I, I don't know why I, th I think of like lint. Think of lint or fur, how it clings to your clothes. Like no matter how much you try to brush it off, it's stuck there. You want to be stuck to God. Like, you can't get, you cannot be separated from him. No matter what's going on, no matter what storm may be blowing, you're stuck to him. And that's how you'll live long in the land. Um, Proverbs 18, 21, it's a familiar verse for us. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they who indulge in it shall eat the fruit of it for death or for life. Your words matter. If you're wanting to live long, you can't be speaking words that are saying, well, I'm, I, you know, I've, I'm probably going to die young. How many people have said things like that? Keith Moore talks about that. Um, that have made, made statements like that. Maybe they're joking. Or, oh, yeah, thrill me to death. I, I'm dying to do that. You know, watch your words. Your words are important. If you're speaking things like that, but then on the other hand, you're starting to say, well, I believe I'm going to live, with long life he satisfies me, I'm going to live to 120, you're, you're contradicting yourself. You're contradicting yourself by the words you're speaking, and you're not going to end up getting the fruit that you want. Um, in Isaiah 38, 5, we see that Hezekiah prayed to the Lord. He was very sick, and the Lord had said, yeah, you're going to die. Well, he turned. He repented, basically. He prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said, I'm going to add 15 years to your life. So his life was extended. Proverbs 10, 27 says, The reverent and worshipful fear of the Lord prolongs one's days, but the years of the wicked shall be made short. Uh, another translation says, the fear of Adonai adds length to life, but the years of the wicked are cut short. You see the pattern through these scriptures. You're following Yahweh, your life is going to be long. 
you don't follow Yahweh, your life is going to be short. It's not, it's not that hard. It's pretty simple. He breaks it down pretty simply for us. Uh, let's turn over to Exodus chapter 23. I love this passage. <clears throat> They're all good. <laughs> Exodus chapter 23, starting at verse, let's see, keep backing up, look at the verse before it, and then that one's good too, so you keep backing up. Um, let's see, uh, we'll back up to verse 20. Behold, I send an angel before you to keep and guard you on the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared. Now see, there's the protection. He's bringing you to the place that he prepared. Now there's some instructions that follow it. Verse 21, give heed to him. Listen to and obey his voice. Be not rebellious before him or provoke him, for he will not pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. But if you will indeed listen to and obey his voice and all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to your enemy and an adversary to your adversaries. You know, if we're, if we're facing attacks of the enemy in our life, then we can stand upon that verse. If we're following what Yahweh is telling us to do, if we're obeying his voice, then we can stand upon the verse that he's going to be an enemy to our enemies and an adversary to our adversaries. If, 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 he's, if he's going to set himself as an enemy to someone, do you think they stand any chance? No. Uh, verse 23, when my angel goes before you and brings you to the Amorites, <clears throat> the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I reject them and blot them out, you shall not bow down to their gods or serve them or do after their works, but you shall utterly overthrow them and break down their pillars and images. See, destroy anything that's of the world, lest it get on you. Uh, verse 25, you shall serve the Lord your God. He shall bless your bread and water, and I will take sickness from your midst. None shall lose her young by miscarriage or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. Fulfill. What does it mean to fulfill something? It means to make it full, make it, make it big, make it full of meaning. He's going to fulfill the number of our days if we're following him, if we're serving him. Part of fulfilling the number of his days is that he's going to warn us of things to come. He's going to show us things that are on the road, kind of tying into what I talked about on Sabbath, that, that may be, okay, there's a cliff on that road. There, you don't want to go down that way because then you're not going to be protected. You're going to get hurt. Everything that he has as warnings in the Bible are to prevent us from getting hurt. And, you know, this, this is where it kind of comes into play that you start looking and you can look across the board and see some examples of people, even, even Christians, who have died young. And you can tell by how they died that it wasn't the right way. Okay, Nancy Dufresne's a good example, okay? Ed Dufresne, her husband, they, they're leading this ministry and everything. He dies in a plane crash. Was that the will of God? No. Nancy Dufresne herself came out afterwards and said that wasn't God's will. Now, this is her husband she's talking about. She could, uh, out of all things, well, maybe there was some reason for it and all that. No, it wasn't God's will. We settled that right away. It was not God's will for her husband to die in that plane crash. Now, she said, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about why he might have died because that's between him and the Lord. What you can tell is that somewhere along the way, Yahweh was trying to warn him. Yahweh was trying to warn him, maybe don't get on that plane. Don't go there right now. Wait a while. Something. He was trying to warn him. And whether it's just you get caught up in conversation, you get caught up in your own thoughts, you get caught up in, in what's going on, you can ignore and override those warnings. You think of it, sometimes Holy Spirit's voice is that instant, still, small voice. It's, it can be as simple as turn right, not left. If you're not training yourself to hear his voice, if you're not training yourself to follow it, then you're more likely to override that or miss it. As soon as you step outside of what Holy Spirit's telling you to do, then you're in a place where the enemy can attack you. Um, Mary Fran had this, this saying that she said, if, if, if she ever was to die in a car crash or something, right on my tombstone, Mama missed it. Mama missed it. 
That's, that's as simple as it gets. I don't care who it is. I don't care how much of a faith person you were, how much of a faith person, hey, preacher you were. If somebody dies early, it's not the will of God. It's on their part, never God's. That's, that, we got to settle that in our lives, and it doesn't matter who it is. It's never God's will. Uh, sometimes things can be set in motion through decisions that we make naturally or spiritually that cannot be reversed. You think of somebody who has smoked all their life, and at the end of their life, all of a sudden, they find that they have lung cancer. Well, I don't know why God put lung cancer on this person. No, the choices that they made set in course that the, the consequences. Eating the wrong things. You eat all kinds of fried foods your whole life. You're, don't be surprised when in the end you start having heart problems. And that's not a negative confession. That has to do with your choices in life. You get to choose what you put in your mouth. You get to choose what you put before your eyes. You get to choose what you d decide to do. But you can't, you can't choose the consequences that are attached to it. Um, and it has nothing to do with God causing something to happen. The consequences are on the path. Let's turn over to Psalm 92 real quick. Have a couple more scriptures and then we'll close. <clears throat> Psalm 92 and we'll start down at verse 12. The uncompromisingly righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. Be long-lived, stately, upright, useful, and fruitful. They shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon, majestic, stable, durable, and incorruptible. Planted in the house of the Lord, they shall flourish in the courts of our God. Growing in grace, they shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be full of sap, of spiritual vitality, and rich in the verdure of lo trust, love, and contentment. They are living memorials to show that the Lord is upright and faithful to his promises. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. That's what our life is supposed to be, a testimony. You think the people that are looking at this life, that they're majestic and stable and durable and incorruptible, upright, stately, all those words that they're using to describe that person, that's a testimony to others. Because our lives are not supposed to just affect us. It's not just so, yeah, I got to live a long life. No, but how, how did you live your life? How did, you, how did you fulfill the number of your days? How many people did you impact throughout your life? Your life is not your own. You're here for a purpose. And a lot of times what you find is if somebody loses their sense of purpose in life, if somebody loses their focus on the end of the race and what God has called them to do, they can tend to start to peter out a little early. It can start to be like, well, I'm, I'm no good here, so might as well just go on. And uh, sadly, that has been the, the cause of early death of a lot of older people. It's, it's sad, and even younger people. You give up on life early just because you're not, your, your vision is clouded. You need to start focusing on the things, that, the truths of the word of God that tell you who you are. What's your purposes in life? What God has called you to do? And if you focus on that, it's going to give you that oomph, the spiritual oomph to, get, to give it all, your all, to run with determination. So long life is ours. It it's belongs to us. Let's back up to Psalm 91. Psalm 91 is the psalm. I, we're not going to be able to uh, go into detail of it all tonight, but it is the psalm of protection. It's the psalm that we should all be reading at least every day. It's, a, it, it's something that we need to internalize and not just read it out of, a, yeah, he who dwells in the secret place of the most high. No, it's not just rote memorization. It's internalizing the, the, the truth of it in our lives and personalizing it. He who dwells in the secret place of the most high shall remain stable and fixed under the shadow of the almighty whose power no foe can withstand. Now, right away, he who dwells, what does it mean to dwell? It means you're, you're fixed there, you're lodged there. Or in, in, the, in the words of Deuteronomy, you're clinging to the Lord. You're clinging to his presence. Everything else that's in this, pa in this chapter is based on you dwelling in the secret place. That's your part. The rest of it are the consequences, if you will, or the results of dwelling in the secret place. 
If you're not dwelling in the secret place, you don't even have a leg to stand on to believe in the rest of the, the promises of this passage. I will say of the Lord. Now remember, we said death and life are in the power of the tongue. What you say matters. What do you say of the Lord? He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. On him I lean and rely, and in him I confidently trust. For then he will deliver you. So after you're dwelling in the secret place, after you're saying he's my refuge, he's my fortress, then he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. Then he will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings shall you trust and find refuge. His truth and his faithfulness are a shield and a buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror of the night. Now, fear can open a door too. We've talked about that many times. Fear can open a door for the enemy to get in as much as anything else. Um, Yeshua said, which of you by worrying can add even a, a few hours to his life? Well, the reverse of that is true. If you're worrying, you're going to be taking hours away from your life. People who are living in stress and worry and anxiety and fear, they're actually draining years from their life by doing that. Um, you shall not be afraid of the terror of the night, nor of the arrow, the evil plots and slanders of the wicked that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor of the destruction and sudden death that surprise and lay waste at noonday. It's covering all aspects of anything that could poss possibly harm you in this, in this passage. He's being so thorough as to say, Anything that, that could come and kill you or steal anything from you is covered in here. Anything. doesn't matter what it is. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only a spectator shall you be, yourself inaccessible in the secret place of the Most High, as you witness the reward of the wicked. Now, if you're not in the secret place, if you're down with the wicked, engaging in the same stuff that they're, they're engaging in, you're not going to be a spectator. You're going to be a participator in the destruction. That's what happened to the people during the flood. They were all down in the, in the, in the uh, wickedness together, and the floodwaters came and overtook them. Because you have made the Lord your refuge. Now, see, he's, clear, he's making it clear again. It's because of this. Because you have made the Lord your refuge and the Most High your dwelling place, there shall no evil befall you, nor any plague or calamity come near your tent. If there's a calamity coming near your tent, then you left the door open for it somewhere. For he will give his angels a special charge over you to accompany and defend and preserve you in all your ways of obedience and service. Now, it's not just in any way you decide to go. It's in your ways of obedience and service as you're following him. They shall bear you up on their hands, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the adder. The young lion and the serpent shall you trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, this is God talking. Therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he knows and understands my name, has a personal knowledge of my mercy, love, and kindness, trusts and relies on me knowing I will never forsake him. No, never. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. So there's the promise right there. With long life will I satisfy him. We're supposed to be satisfied. Live until you're satisfied. You know, okay, so you, you're given 120 years. If by reason of strength you decide you're not quite satisfied, live a little bit longer. I mean, I think most people just don't decide after that point that they want to continue going on with life. But you want to live until you've lived a full life, until you're satisfied. And that is the promise that he has, he has given us. And he will show us his salvation. So at, this, at the end of this passage is where Paul was. I fought, fought the good fight. I've finished my race. I've kept the faith. With long life, he's satisfied him. He's satisfied with his life at that point. You know, he made it through a lot of things that most people wouldn't have made it through. You think of even, even John. They tried boiling him in a pot of oil, and he wouldn't boil. 
So they ended up just sticking him on an island, like, we don't know what to do with this guy. We can't kill him. So stuck him on an island, he wrote the book of Revelation. Like, you just couldn't get that guy down. Um, but with long life, he satisfies us. So we need to determine that we're going to make it all the way. And we need to determine that not only is Yahweh keeping us all the way, not only are we making it all the way, but we're making all the way because we're doing our part. We're doing what's required of us to make it all the way. We're following Yahweh. We're doing what he has told us to do. We're, we're keeping his commandments. We're guarding our mouth, guarding what we say, guarding, guarding what we put in our bodies. Why do you think he has the dietary laws in there? He knows what's best for us to eat and what's best not to eat. And you know what? The more, the more we, we walk along this journey, you can tend to have people that are like, well, you're so, you're so picky. You're so like, restricted on that. You're, you're a cult. That's the biggest thing that they say. You're a cult. Well, you know what? I'd rather be called all those things and still be living a long, happy life and still be prospering and still be uh, protected when the world's not protected. It's better to live with the praise of God than the praise of man. And we got to determine that we're going to walk we're going to walk that way. This is, this is it. Choose you this day whom you will serve. He set before us life and death, blessings and cursings. We get to choose. We get to choose the course of our life. And if the course of your life hasn't been something that's, that's been good up until this point, well, you can choose a different way. Get back on the path that Yahweh's called you to be on. And do it quick because the day is late. These are powerless times. We don't want to be opening ourselves up for the enemy to get strikes in because he is roaming around like a lion, seeking whom he can devour. But he may not devour those who are in the secret place. Amen? We trust you've gotten something out of this message, those of you who are watching. We will see you on Saturday at 11 o'clock. Until then, you have a blessed week.